Welcome, everybody. Um, I'm Peter Jones from Smart Anchor Ventures. Um, we're a business that launched last year to uh, come and invest in businesses in, uh, in Wales, uh, sort of early stage and growth businesses. And uh, I'm also here to sort of dispel the myth uh, of the lack of innovation in Wales um, and put some fire back into the dragon that's here. And uh, I've got a host of uh, a panel here of experienced entrepreneurs and investors that uh, have started their businesses in Wales that uh, are going to take us through a debate of how to raise funding and the experience that they've had in raising funding uh, in, um, uh, in, in Wales. Uh, the agenda we've got here, we've got, uh, we're going to go through the uh, entrepreneurship and funding in Welsh business. Um, and then we're going to sort of open up uh, the panel to, to questions to, to the audience. But just before we start, um, why, why did we set up in Wales? Well, it's an absolutely fantastic place uh, to set a business up. Um, it's, uh, it's actually one of the most innovative places in the UK at the moment. Innovation UK actually ran a survey um, to say that we've got 40% share here in Wales in terms of innov innovative uh, businesses. We've got a huge talent pool, despite, I think, what people have said. Uh, in some of the, some of the uh, talks that there's a, a lack of talent or there's a skill shortage. Um, there's still some fantastic universities that are actually building some great, uh, great talent. We've got some phenomenal businesses like uh, um, DropTask that uh, Chris Griffiths was, uh, has been pre presenting with, Visolution. Um, we've got the Raspberry Pi that's actually developed here. We have incubators uh, like Alacrity. Um, so, you know, there's, there's huge opportunity here. So that whole myth about, uh, you know, why, why do people come down to Wales? What's in Wales? Um, we've got some fantastic uh, opportunity here. Um, you'd be maybe may surprised to hear that Wales is actually leading the way in, in, uh, in business growth within the digital sector as well. Um, we're in the top five cluster for company turnover within the digital sector. South Wales in itself is actually employing more than 28,000 people uh, in South Wales, and that's growing all the time. Um, just to give you an example, digital businesses grew in the last three years by over uh, 87%, and when you look at the UK average, that's, that's pretty spectacular compared to, uh, to, compared to everywhere else. Um, South Wales is in the top five of the uh, UK's fastest growing clusters uh, in the UK. 18% um, of businesses are actually formed uh, in the digital sector. So there's a huge amount going on uh, within the whole digital sector. But then you've also got the location itself. It's not just about digital. Um, earlier today, there was a, a great panel about the opportunities for businesses to start up with the whole co-working spaces. You get great value for money here. You're only two and a half, or just under two hours from uh, London on the train. Um, you've got co-working spaces like ICE uh, over in Caerphilly. You've got Indicube that have got 22 offices all around Wales uh, for startups and uh, entrepreneurial businesses to, to base themselves. Tech Hub, we had Paul here earlier. Um, £40 million has just been spent on launching the Life, Life Sciences Hub down in, in, Swansea, uh, in um, Cardiff Bay. And then we've got additional uh, accelerators that are going to be launching very soon, so Entrepreneurial Spark. And then again, Chris Griffiths uh, is going to be uh, launching, hopefully later this year, uh, the Tech Marina. So in terms of working here, there's no excuse why uh, we can't come down. And just to give you an idea of other benefits, um, the lifestyle, the cost of actually running a business here is a hell of a lot lower. So from a fundraising perspective, it makes it a lot easier to sort of uh, justify uh, coming down here and, and hopefully it helps in actually raising the money as well. Um, but then we come to the hard bit of actually wherever you are, funding businesses is actually very difficult. Um, and I think what we're going to do here is hopefully take you through some of the stages. But here are some of the options that you do have. We've talked a lot um, over the last couple of days about uh, the availability of funding through the Welsh Government. You've got the Digital Development Fund, which uh, invests in early stage businesses uh, in Wales. You then have sort of debt funding through repayable business finance funding, uh, finance fund. 
And then the Life Sciences Hub have their Life Sciences Investment Fund and then the Smart Innovation Program. And there are various others in there. I think, as Paul said again earlier uh, in the um, starting a business panel, that you know, there's no shortage of, kind of money. It's just about how you actually go about getting it. And then you have Finance Wales, which is very much on the equity side uh, of fundraising. They have a seven, seven and a half million pound uh, fund called the Wales Tech Technology Seed Fund. Um, they've got relationships with a number of uh, accelerator and innovation hubs. And part of that uh, is the affiliation with Xenos, which is the uh, sort of business angel network. And you can see that nudged. Uh, W2 Data and uh, Obidu are one of the f first three uh, big investments that uh, Finance Wales and James Henderson and the guys have actually made uh, out of that fund. And in fact, we've got Warren here, who's part of, who's, who's the co-founder of Nudge, that's going to be on the panel. Um, and then you've got the angel networks. Now, um, people think, well, where, where, where do we actually find the angels? Um, there's an increasing number of angels that are actually interested in Welsh businesses. They see that uh, um, there's some great opportunities here. London's becoming a very crowded space when it comes to investing, and they're looking for quality deal flow. And actually, from Smart Anchor Ventures' point of view, it's one of the key reasons that we came here, is to sort of uh, actually look at uh, the quality of businesses and, and uh, make the most of the opportunities. But... Needless to say, there's, there's a real need for, for sort of more Welsh angels to invest in Welsh businesses that we can grow and, and build into sort of big global businesses. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about crowdfunding uh, as one of the sources of funding. I, I'm sitting on the fence and looking to see what happens because I think they've done a great job in, in, in making uh, investing accessible to sort of non-institutional uh, people that just want to get involved in early stage businesses. It's still early days. It's a fantastic um, PR machine when it comes to uh, raising money, but I really would say you need to keep your eyes open. Don't assume that just because it's going out there on, in the public that you're automatically going to get funded. There's still a lot of hard work that needs to be done um, in actually raising initial funding, and I would say crowdfunding is, is something that should be part of, part of an a fundraise, but not relied on solely, but we can talk about that more later. Um, there's a number of players in the market. Um, I think the three key ones are sort of Cedars, Crowdcube, and uh, Syndicate Room. Um, but overall, it's regardless of which funding route you take, uh, it's hard work to find the right investors and to actually neg negotiate uh, the, the right terms. And actually, it's one of the reasons that we put this panel together is because I think as an entrepreneur, you know, it's where do you start? Um, where, do you, where, where do you get into contact with the right people? Where do you find the money? What's the right route? You know, do we go through government funding? You know, do we go through angel investing, crowdsourcing? You know, even VCs, a lot of people don't understand when they're setting up their first business. So without further ado, I'm going to ask the, the panel to actually come up on stage and, and introduce themselves. So we've got uh, Warren from Nudged, Tom from Tazia, Neil Cocker from Ramp, and then Ben Scholes from uh, Paper Trail, and Simon Powell from ESIS. So, just actually, just to get the ball rolling, can I just have a show of hands of how many entrepreneurs there are actually in the room today? So, quite a few then. And how many of you uh, have actually are in the process of raising funding at the moment? Okay, that's a good portion. And how many have actually raised money at the moment? Okay, so that's it's a good representation. I say so. I think I'm just going to open up and sort of say, Tom, I'm going to start with you. I think. So, what sort of funding do you think um, have you been involved with uh, with your business? Oh, actually, sorry. Before I say that, I should actually get you to introduce yourself first, shouldn't I? So, sorry, Warren. Do you want to start with you, start with yourself? Yeah. Hi, I'm Warren. I'm from Nudged. Uh, we're a health tech business, and we work with large corporates to assess the health of their workforces and then automate communications. So health and wellness programs before, become more effective. And to date, we've raised uh, around 300, um, and the business has been going for about two years. 
Hi everybody, I'm Tom Stroud. I'm the founder and CEO of Tazio. Tazio is an online assessment and video interview platform. Uh, we were founded uh, five years ago, just coming up five years ago now. Um, we're currently in the process of raising funds, um, so we've been bootstrapping the business pretty much for the last five years, and we're just now hopefully looking to do a capital raise at the moment. Uh, hi, I'm Neil Cocker. I'm the founder of Ramp. Uh, we're an e-commerce platform that powers uh, on-demand merch and uh, merchandise sites. Uh, some of you might know Dizzy Jam, which is our sort of flagship site. Um, and yeah, we're in the middle of a, a relatively significant seed round raise. Hi, my name's Ben. I've um, set up a, a business in North Wales, uh, which is called Paper Trail, and it's a software as a service product. Uh, that's used currently by uh, lots of businesses throughout Wales, uh, well, and the globe, um, for health and safety inspections. Hi, uh, my name's Simon Powell. Um, I re represent a number of businesses, which is just as easy as one. Um, ESIS is a, a prediction engine. We look at using artificial intelligence and machine learning to actually make uh, predictions. That's been going for about, uh, about three years now but also I chair about uh, five or six other technology businesses, which we actually um, invest in all those businesses as well. So I'm both on the uh, investment side and on the entrepreneurial side as well. Thank you. Excellent, thank you very much, Simon. Uh, so yeah, so I'm gonna start off, I'm gonna kick things off with a few questions and I'm gonna open it out to the audience. So if, you, if you've got some questions that you wanna have ready and then uh, we can sort of crack on. So, so yeah, so, we're talking about all the different types of funding uh, that are available, and it's not obvious which one to go to. It'd be good to hear from uh, from you, Tom, what you've been looking at, what you've been, how, where the funding is you've got to date, and, and what we're, what you're looking for. So, I mean, in terms of the business, we started off, as I say, we bootstrapped the business, so I set the business up myself, self-funded it. Um, as a company, we actually did some software development work just as a as an aside, if you like, for, for, for paying customers to fund the, the growth of the product while we were building it and while we were testing it and prototyping it. Um, we then basically uh, found a private investor, if you like, another company, which we, which we went in business with. Um, so they took a share of the business. Um, and then what we've done now is we've built the business up, and over the last three to four years uh, recently, we've been building up the traction and get it gaining traction. We've been getting some nice big customers, so we now work with people like Jaguar Land Rover, Virgin Media, SAB Miller, um, and uh, a wide range of sort of global companies now. So we've sort of proven the product. Um, so we've got to a stage now where we want to really accelerate the growth of the product. So hence what we're looking to do now is raise capital from investment um, from a range of um, either, well, again, we're open at the moment, I think it's fair to say, either angel investors, VCs. Um, so again, we're looking for a, a reasonable sum of money um, to really accelerate the growth of the business. Um, the other funding that we've gone for as well is um, through the uh, repayable business finance um, from the Welsh Government. And we've managed to secure a couple hundred thousand pounds from that. Um, which has been very helpful, again, I think, from two, two points. One, it's going to help us, hopefully, with cash flow. Um, it'll help us encourage to uh, be able to fund the growth in terms of the staff that we need to take on and grow the business. Um, but also, I think it's been helpful in terms of when we're talking to investors that, again, we've had that sort of vote of confidence, if you want, for a better expression in terms of the, uh, you know, the, the business um, and the fact that we've got that funding in place. Um, obviously, the terms are very attractive. It's interest-free. Um, I think the only thing I would say to anybody looking to do that is, you know, don't think you're going to turn it around in a couple of weeks. It does take quite a long time and a lot of, lot of effort to get it. But again, I think if you can get it, it does help. And again, it's one of those things that you can leverage against uh, when you're looking to raise other equity funds. Yeah. I mean, ben, have you got, what was your experience? Because obviously you're, you know, everyone sort of focuses a lot on South Wales. Your business is based up in North Wales. What, you know, how did you go about um, sort of one, figuring out what funding you needed and where did you get, you know, how did you go about that process? I think um, the the starting point really was was once you've got uh, or build a you know an, an MVP product where you've got people using it, however few that might be, and show yeah. that you can um, you know generate revenue from that. Um, and then it was around how do we do this full time? And for for myself and my business partner, that was uh, needing to step outside of our full time posts to be able to take that leap. Um, so we went through a technology accelerator program. Uh, unfortunately, there isn't any in North Wales, so uh, that meant a lot of travelling to Newcastle. We went through a program called Ignite 100, and that gave us um, 
a small investment for equity, um, which allowed myself and the other founder to work on that, uh, you know, the product a little bit more to make it fit the market. And then we then, uh, that, through that accelerator program, introductions happened to venture capital firms and a, quite a big um, angel investor network as well, which was how, how we got the next round of funding. And since then, we've done that twice since. So you secured the, so both, firstly, you went to the accelerator, which sort of effectively gave you a little bit of funding. Yeah. And then out of that led to your structuring the business, you figured things out, and then effectively went out and got, did an angel round. That's right, yeah, that. yeah. Yeah. And just, just out, because Ben said something really interesting uh, earlier, he was, in, he was in a, talking about accelerators, was actually in a, uh, a panel the other, uh, yesterday, and uh, the question was, how many people here have actually heard of a, an accelerator or know any of accelerators? Uh, and I think Ben was the only person that actually put his hand up. Yeah, the gentleman it's, asked about Y Combinator. Yeah. Does, is, does anybody know what Y Combinator is in this room? Which? Few more, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, um, which is entrepreneurs. I don't need to explain it, but yeah, it's. which is, you know, accelerators. I think, you know, again, I think you could, you, you need to go in with your eyes open, but they provide, you know, really good services in terms of sort of helping you to sort of focus, structure your business, understand putting business plans together, going through the process of funding, you know, and it does it in a very intense environment. But you know, I think that's something from a Welsh point of view. I don't know, Simon, whether that's something that you you believe in from a, uh, an investor and from a, uh, a, an entrepreneur's perspective? I think that however that you can actually get to the position you need to get to to secure the investments you want, mm. I think the most important thing is actually you're comfortable in that path, whichever path that is. Mm. I think from my perspective, um, just as a bit of background, I grew a fairly large software business based up in Cumbran. We probably had 180 to 200 people up there building travel technology, exit that business in 2008 to, uh, to private equity. And then um, went into the wilderness for a little while, then for the last three years have been either startups or turnarounds, of which we must have seven or eight of now, and uh, there's a new one just coming on stream. And each one of those businesses is funded differently. So there's no right, there's no wrong. It's, it's, you need to look at the different businesses. And you need to actually work out what actually the best course is to actually fund that business in the right way with the right partners that are going to add the value. And is it just cash you're looking for, hmm. which is two very different points. But if you've never done it before, how, how, do, you, how do you know which is the right path to actually go down? That's a very good question. Um, I, again, it's, it's very much that there is a lot of advice out there. You need, to, you need to find somebody that you're, again, comfortable in sharing where your direction is going, where you actually want to be, what you're looking to try and achieve. And you need to find some people. That, there's lots of people with experience, maybe in different sectors, maybe. Um, but, you know, we do have, and we do have a, you know, a, a great network of people in Wales. And it's finding those people that can actually help you to make those decisions is actually vital. Because getting that decision wrong could be a very costly decision. Yeah. And on that note, Warren. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you, you've just gone through uh, a couple of fund. You've just closed a second round, a small round of funding. And I mean, what were the big surprises for you when it came to going through that process? Was there something, you know, or? Well, so yeah, so when, when we first started raising money, I didn't know what we were doing, if I'm honest. So you see the kind of the paper talk around large fundraisers happening over in the States and you kind of have this idea that you want to start a technology company and you want to be funded in some way and it's kind of very hubris driven so you, you, your arrogance says we want lots of money to do this thing and over time I've realized that we didn't really know why we wanted the money so we didn't have a proper strategic plan in place what we had was a lot of energy and a vision and we knew there was a cost and I think we made some really significant errors in the way that we did the planning of the business based on that, acquiring that money, and, and anyone who is in the same position as me, I would urge them to sit down and look from the top down into their business and to use tools like, so the, the business model canvas is not necessarily always appropriate, but is a good way to iterate on business models. And the real key question is, what do you need the money for? And, and what else do you need apart from the money? So when, when Simon's saying they've funded each of their businesses in different ways, it's probably because they've looked at the top of the business and said, look, so we need to bring in an investor who's got connections in this market, or we need to bring in institutional money that's going to offer us this stability, or this, or this, or that. 
And the best way to kind of go about that, I find, is to you put it down on that, that business model canvas, you look at the gaps, where do you think you're weak, where, where's the knowledge lacking, and then you, you make the jump. And the, where my knowledge was lacking initially was in, I come from a creative sector background, so most of the stuff I've done has been on a, a slightly different business model to what Nudged operates. So in consultancy you charge and you get money quite quick. With a product-based business you've got that cash flow, cash burn, so you've got that big dip, and deciding when sales are gonna kick in is a really difficult thing. Like no one can predict sales in a business that doesn't exist, especially when you're producing something that's new to the market. And the mistakes we made were all driven by trying to drive product revenue too early, when actually a lot of investors, the right money, the smart money, understands that what you're investing in initially is to build a platform, to build something that people will be interested enough to buy. And long term, the job is to monetize it, and particularly in things like B2B SaaS, which is where we are. So we sell business to business, software as a service, B2B SaaS. For anyone who doesn't know the acronyms I keep spouting. Um, there are relatively well-trodden paths that say once a business buys something, they buy it for you know, three to five years, especially if you integrate with the systems they've already got. So you end up with a very predictable revenue model once you've figured out your revenue. And once you've got that traction, it's actually really valuable. So the first stage investors is high risk money. You're building the platform and that's really the expertise you want to bring in is people who can help you get to market. Second phase, traction in the market, embedding, you know, integration, finding better sales models, finding efficiencies in those sales models. And, and that's, for my market, for my business, that's, that's the things I look back and say, I, those are the things we did wrong. Yeah. And, and, and again, it's, it's different for every fundraise as well. I think one of the things that we've been discussing is that, you know, it's amazing that, you know, there's so many entrepreneurs in this room, but actually there isn't any sort of real definitive sort of dummy's guide to here are the core steps regardless of what your business is that, that takes you through. And I think that's probably something that is, that is sort of needed when it comes to sort of uh, raising funding. Um, the other sort of key challenge when raising funding that we always come across is obviously the whole subject of valuation. You know, early stage businesses, you know, I know Simon Gibson was saying, you know, you, there is no right business plan. You know, it really is what you can get for your money. It's about what your heart says, what your mind says, and what your gut feeling says. Um, I mean, Neil, you've, you're obviously in the process of raising money at the moment. How did you, what process did you go through to getting valuation? What, how, did, how, did it get, how did you get there as part of the, the um, business plan? Well, actually, it, it's kind of related to, to what Warren was saying. I think it's a really, really important thing to understand when, if you went to like a hairdresser's business conference or a news agent's business conference or a mechanic's business conference, nobody would be talking about funding. And funding on this level is really, really important, particularly for tech startups. For all the reasons Warren mentioned is because you don't see revenue. You may not even have a business plan until year two. You, you know, some of Warren's talk yesterday was touching on the lean startup thing of um, no business survives first contact with users. In other words, you define this concept, this idea, this vision, and you put it out there, and then people use it in a different way or don't use it at all, and then you have to try and tweak your, the way the business works to, to accommodate that. Um, and that's why it's important to that iterative model of getting out there, testing it, doing it again, doing it again, doing it again. Um, so it's very difficult to know what your business can look like in two years' time. If you're going to set up a hairdressing salon tomorrow, you've got a fairly good idea of what it's going to look like in three, maybe five years' time. Maybe a bit bigger, maybe a bit shinier, maybe more expensive clients, but fundamentally, it's going to be what it, what it looks like today. Uh, Warren's business will almost certainly not look like what it looks like today. Um, so you're very much having a, this sounds more grandiose than I mean it, but a visionary kind of approach to your business. And you're thinking about where your business is going to be in like two, three years' time. And trying to sell a valuation. So at the moment, we're trying to raise X amount. Um, and so if our investor wants... 20%, then that defines the, the business value at five times X. Um, but the investor says, well, currently, you're hardly making any money at all. And the traditional investor would say, well, you're hardly making any money at all, so therefore, I'm going to give you 50 quid for half your business. And then you go back to the drawing board. But, so, 
we, we're going through a process where our potential investors are, haven't done a lot of investing in tech, so they don't get that actually what they're investing in is high risk, and it's, they're investing in valuation of three to five years down the line. Um, so our valuation is quite high based on our current revenues. If we were a hairdresser that was turning over the amount of money we're turning over now, our business would be worth basically nothing. Uh, it might be worth 20 grand, I don't know, whatever. But it's worth several million if you look at the, the long, the potential. So it's, it's about finding, there, there's obviously a lot of very complex and subtle negotiation you have to go through to validate that. So for us, it's been a case of saying, well, we've got all these partnerships lined up that are gonna, they're going to pay off over the next couple of years, and we've got all this kind of stuff that's going to happen in the next six months, and you can see our traction. And, and the other thing is also your business value isn't just based on revenue and profit in tech. So you look at Instagram, sold for $1 billion, 12 members of staff, never made a penny in revenue. Not a penny. Sold for a $1 billion. You're selling everything from your data to user engagement to people being involved. So Facebook bought Instagram basically for, partly for the data, but mainly for the user engagement, Instagram represented a demographic sector that Facebook wasn't competing in very well, 12 to 15s or whatever it was. Um, so you're, you're not just selling on revenue and profit in the same way in tech. And this is, again, comes back to why investment and funding is really, really important in, in ways that perhaps isn't in, in other more traditional sectors. Yeah, no, that, that, that makes absolute sense. And I think it is about... There are different mindsets of different types, different levels and different types of investment. I think tech is one of those ones that people are still trying to get their head around. And I think you can see there's a huge difference also in the US in terms of the way they address tech investment and the way that the UK uh, addresses sort of They're tech They're much more investment. comfortable with the risk in tech in the yeah. States. Well, they've got a more mature ecosystem. They've heard of Y Combinator. <laughs> <laughs> So, and, and I'm just going to ask one more question before I'm going to open it up to the audience. So, start getting your, your questions ready. You, you mentioned about, uh, you know, one of the investors you're looking at is not traditionally a tech investor. Um, I'll open this out to the panel and then we can go to the questions. Is, from your point of view, um, what, how important is it to find the right and what is the right investor? You know, if someone comes along and says, right, here's the money and, you know, it's they haven't invested in your type of business before. Should you take the money or should you start looking for, you know, what, what is the money worth to you? Is it other than just the ability to, to get the cash? Um, I mean, as an investor, I'll take it for, take, uh, give Simon that question first. As an investor. As an investor. Right. Um, yeah. As an investor, so, obviously, it's about the people. Yeah. It's always about the people. It's, a, uh, it's, it's, especially when we're looking at turnarounds. Yes, the business model is important. What are the existing clients? What is the technology? Can we do something with it or not? But as an investor, you look at the people. And then you always... So if it's a startup, the people are the most important thing because uh, all those other factors I just, just spoke about don't exist. There won't be a client base. There won't be a technology stack. There won't be all the other things that you'd, you'd like to think are in place. So, again... Um, when you've got the right team in place, uh, businesses, from my perspective, are, are very much, they're a process. You do the right things, you execute them, they will work. Um, mm. they, they always, they're never a straight road. There'll always be a challenge. These, it's a, you know, you want to go from A to B, it's going to be a very windy road. And as I say to a lot of people, sometimes we actually go backwards to go forwards. But from my perspective, it's always around actually where are we trying to take the business? What are we trying to do with it? And how can we actually get to that end point that we want to? And without the right people, you may, you may as well not bother. You may as well just close up and go home because it's all around the people to make that happen from our perspective. Okay, that makes sense. And Ben, I mean, so you're, you're going to be looking for some, some funding further, further on down the line. So have you come across where, you know, have you ever had doubts in terms of whether you had the right investor or not? Um, right at the early right at the start, I think I did in terms of yeah talking to investors that maybe didn't understand the tech models and uh, the you know the larger opportunities out there. But um, I'm certainly really confident in the ones that we have around the table now in the fact that they understand they 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 see they know the vision they've see, they've worked or are closely related to other similar businesses. So 
Um, it, I think it's just around setting expectations. Because yeah. if you if you're going to spend, you know, a fortnight working with an investor on something, well, you just wasted a fortnight, and you've and you've and you've and you've not set the expectations right. So, mm. yeah. Uh, there's a term that someone keeps saying to me about kissing a lot of frogs and things like that. Just, you just got to go and meet as many people as possible, yeah. and they'll be the person that buys into you, your team, um, and is, and trust that whilst you're not keeping them sweet, that you you're working your tits off. You know, you're, yeah. you're working hard to generate uh, value in your business. Neil, yes, sometimes it's compromising me if you if you're desperate for the cash and you've got um, two weeks until. Uh, the, someone turns the electricity off and you can't afford to eat anymore, then you kind of don't really, can't get fussy. Yeah. If you've already got a, an established model that's got revenue and everyone, you know, everyone's paying their mortgage, even if it's, they're living on beans on toast, then you can be a bit more picky. Um, so there's always going to be a compromise. I think there's very, very few instances where you get the, the dream investor. Um, but, you know, in our circumstance, I think we've got a, a good mix of money and uh, if not direct knowledge certainly access to other people within their network and you know so uh, yeah I'm, I'm at the moment I kind of feel like we have a good a good mix um, but yeah you, you, I don't think there's any such thing as the perfect investor. Yeah. I mean Tom what do you consider to be the right money for you? Go through the process. Uh, from my perspective, I think there's two types of investors. First of all, there's, there's the investors who are wealthy. They want to put in 25K and don't really care what happens, to be honest, with, as long as they get a return on. They maybe get a once a quarter, they'll get an update. So in a way, as a business, you can, you know, they, they, they don't really affect you that much. So they put the money in as long as you're actually delivering the returns for them. That's great. That's fine. They're not going to you know, cause you too much problems. Um, but I do think if you are going to have an investor who's putting in a larger amount of money and actually you're going to be as a smart investor, so somebody's going to bring more to the business than just the cash, then you really, really should spend a lot of time making sure that that fit is right because actually you'll end up spending a lot of time with them. You'll be in a lot of pressured situations with them. Um, so I think making sure that is, is that relationship works and is, is good is, is really important. And I know from personal experience that when it doesn't work right, it's extremely painful. It can take a long time to unwind those, in those situations. And it takes your eye off the ball. It means you're not focusing on what you should be focusing on. You're not getting the support you should be getting. So for those kind of investors, personally, um, I would now, I wouldn't take the money even if there was a lot more money offered and I didn't actually get on with the person and I didn't think it was a good fit. Um, I'd walk away from it and I would, I'd, you know, I'd eat beans on toast for the next six months until we could find the next investor. Because if you believe in your business, then you'll find the right investor. But so I do think that's really important, personally. Yeah, I mean, we, slight tangent, Warren. But we talked about crowdfunding, <coughs> and they're obviously, you know, they're invest as well. I mean, what's your view on on that? As a, you know, are they right or wrong? It's horses for courses, so not every pound is created equal. So if you've got someone who's got great industry links, who's willing to put money or time into your business, then that £10,000 that they give you might actually immediately convert into, you know, 100 grand's worth of sales, which sales are ultimately the lifeblood of any business. You, you don't, like, we can, I think we can leave alone the unicorn models of Facebook and Instagram and not really look at them for South Wales right now because even in Silicon Valley, 99% of people are never going to hit that. Uh, and the real reality is that most of the businesses we start will fail. So really our main job is to mitigate those risks. Finance is a way to mitigate risk. That's all it is. So the only reason I'm raising money is to de-risk my organization in some way. So I will take the money that most effectively de-risks my organization. If crowdfunding gets me more money for less equity and allows me more space to take on more finance and the finance, the volume of finance is what I need, or if things like Kickstarter are great sales routes, they, they validate product sale. So if I need to validate the sale of my product in a really low risk manner, because running a Kickstarter campaign might only cost you know five to 10 grand, then that's an effective way to de-risk my, my startup. And I think as a founder, specifically the first time round, when you don't have the strategy or the experience, a good way to think of this, so the way I think of my startup is I'm, I'm driving a train as quickly as I can and building the railway track in front of it at the same time. So every now and again, I have to move the railway track, slow the train down slightly, but most of the time, I'm just chucking coal in and laying, laying steel. And um, the, the main thing I'm doing is trying to de-risk 
everything. Find the risk in your organization and limit it. So one of the, I think one of the smarter things we managed to do is we took institutional money from Finance Wales that we knew wasn't going to come with a huge amount of advice. So we built an advisory board who uh, earned sweat equity on the side who provided the advice that Finance Wales weren't providing because you know, they, they've got a broad range of investments and we knew the people we wanted to bring on to accelerate the business. So you can mix and match. So if you do crowdfunding, there's, there's ways to leverage the advice that it lacks, but it, it, it's a strategic decision. Like make, make, a, make a sensible choice, and, but, but weigh up the risk. Risk is the, it, risk is the thing that keeps you awake at night, the unknown unknowns. Excellent. Well, I'm going to open it up to the floor. Has anyone got any questions they'd like to ask the panel? Should we go for Neil over here in the middle? I think there's a mic actually going to come around. Don't worry, it's not a difficult question for Ben, like I promised I'd do. <laughs> um, just in your, in your sort of negotiations and discussions with um, angels or VCs or whatever, did you ever talk about exit strategies and exit plans and sort of look that far? Or was it more just the, the, the need and, and the demand that you had at the time? Uh, okay. Yeah, I think it, it's, it's quite important, really, because that's part of the vision, isn't it? You know, I'm not motivated to tear around the world over the next five years just for the sake of it. It's clearly for, you know, a, bigger, a big opportunity somewhere. And so you, they need, they've got to buy into that. So, yeah, you have to have a discussion around exits but it's incredibly hard then to um you know to compare to other businesses that have exited for example because there might not be any in that space or there might not be those relevant so yeah you just you have to you have to talk about it yeah without a doubt you know it's part it's part of it's part of building a you know a technology business i feel really yeah i mean to be honest i think you you need a vision so people that are investing in you are going to want to know what your, what your yeah, plan yeah. is. I couldn't as, hand on heart say that's how we're going to do it. I'm still trying to work it out now. Like, you know, who it, I'm still trying to find the person who might potentially buy or might acquire or you know, wherever that might be. So it's, well, I think, think you've got to you have know, a shared discussion on it. Every business chain, I think it's happening more and more is that businesses that start out with a plan, you can almost guarantee that it's not going to be the business that they no. uh, envisioned it being you know, for better or for worse. So, uh, so yeah. So, any other questions? Sorry, just, just about that. It's very unique in this sector, really, isn't it? Because you get, most people start up a business not to sell it. They sell it, it's, you know, it's yeah. lifestyle. So, mm -hmm. it's just interesting that all of you are nodding. You're it's, all there. You've built a business to get rid of it. So. It's, not, it's not unique to the sector. Can I yeah, so it's, it's, not, it's not unique to the sector because there's consolidation in other markets. So taxis, hairdressers, they all consolidate. What we're seeing here, and I like the Andreessen Horowitz model, that technology and mobile is eating the world. So every sector is open to disruption from technology and then from mobile. And so what we're seeing is land grabs. And because people are grabbing segmented slices of land, it means that the main competitor in that market, the, the people who are most capitalized, if they're smart, will come along and eat up the smaller competitors to find their niche markets. So it's kind of basic economic forces that are kind of come into play. And if you're smart in terms of valuation, in terms of exit, what you do is you look at new emerging markets where larger organizations who are established can't necessarily reach to as quickly. And that's the strategic play is to say, see this emerging and IBM can't hit that market or you know Nike can't hit that market and therefore if you plan an exit you're not really planning to exit to Nike you, you might not know who your exit is it might be so like likely exits were nudged you could say we are most likely to exit to someone like Zenefits who just raised half a billion in the states and they're a HR platform so they wouldn't have they didn't exist two years ago like they, 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 there was no way to predict that but what we're saying is there is going to be a digital health technology market for businesses that is going to exist. So we're going to create a business in that and try and find some traction. And then we may be the unicorn that eats everyone else up, and so there may never be an exit. But we're going to expect some consolidation because that's a precedent that we've seen in lots of other economic sectors of the market that weren't powered by digital technology, that were powered by industrialization or you know, uh, internationalization or, or whatever the forces are. I think the other thing I would say as well is, um, in terms of exit for the investor, that's not necessarily exit from the business. Everybody seems to think it's, oh, we, you're gonna exit your business in five years time, which means you're gonna sell it, and then you're gonna buy your yacht and clear off around the Caribbean. For <clears throat> some of us who are still 
just the right side of 50. Um, basically, you know, my, my, my objective is really to build a business and grow it. It's not necessarily to exit in three, four, five years' time, which is when the investor might want to get out, but I'd like to be in a position where the business can be that in a situation that, yes, that next round of investment can come in from a private equity firm or from a, you know, potentially from a bigger, you know, competitor coming in and to buy in, but the business still carries on. So I think there's, there's a differentiation between the two. Yeah. It's, it is very interesting talking about exits and, um, and it's not just in the technology space. Our family business was retail travel agencies. We had about 20 around the area and we sold, sold those many years ago when, when we could see the decline of the high street was coming around from a travel agency perspective. But, um, you know, I put 20 years into, into building a, a business like Comtech. Um, we, we started it from three people and we exited, as I said, in 2008. And that exit for me should have been the restart of it. Um, just made a mistake into the private equity guys I sold the business to. Would still do the deal again today if, the, if that deal was offered to me. Um, but was fortunate enough to buy that business back um, in October last year. So, again, you, you, you know, an exit isn't necessarily the end. And I think, you know, earlier on, most people actually put their hands up as, uh, as entrepreneurs in this room. We all know that actually, actually running the business is, is really hard work. You know, it's, it's every day. It's, ev it's all the time that you possibly have. And whatever salary you take out the business, actually, there isn't a, a repayment for the work that actually goes in. The exit is the repayment, but the exit isn't the end. The exit should be the restart and the rebirth of the business, as I see it. I think just one other point on that is that everyone almost assumes that they talk about a three to five year exit. On the other hand, I think there's people that I've spoken to that actually say, you know what, I actually, I'm not in it for the exit, certainly not within three to five years. I'm actually here to grow this business. I really, I love what I do in this business. I've got a great team and we want to continue growing it. You know, you look at, you look at Facebook, you look at Google, you know, Google's what, 15 years old now? It's still the two same guys that have, there's been, they've IPO'd, so you, you could, I suppose, in some respects, you could say, so there's exit where you sell the business, there's exit where I suppose you can realise some of the, the money that you've, the value that you've put in it, you know, so, um, but yeah, that's interesting point. So, this guy over here. Um, Jerry Ellis, a couple of questions. Um, first of all, I think that the average time to exit is something in the region of seven to 12 years for invested in company, and so three to five years is pretty much impossible unless you're very, 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 very lucky. Right? So um, the question was, <clears throat> most of the responses um, earlier on were equally applicable regardless of where you are on a geographic basis. So the same thing would apply in London as to apply elsewhere. So what we're in Wales. So what are the different benefits of raising money in Wales or negativities of raising money in Wales? Yeah, Neil? I think the difficulty is, um, particularly in Wales and particularly to do with tech, is we don't have a, a very clear second layer of uh, entrepreneur investors who made their money uh, and are putting their time and money back into the sector. So just to give that a stereotype, if you go hang around East London, you're bound to bump into a 32-year-old who has got a spare half million from selling their startup to Google or whatever. That's a, obviously a stereotype, but you know what I mean. Um, so we, we don't have that. Wales is a post-industrial nation. We don't have a, a great legacy of technology here uh, in most respects, and so we don't have many smart investors. Um, I, you know, you go, you go down the M4 and there's lots and lots of understand, uh, investors who understand tech, are comfortable with the risk involved in tech. It's not the case here in Wales. So that's one downside. One upside uh, is um, that uh, the valuations that investors can get uh, is starting to become more uh, readily apparent to those sort of in London, other parts of the UK, other parts of the world. So they can get a comparable business for, they can get a stake in a comparable business for a lot less. So uh, a smart growing startup like Warren's uh, might have a valuation of 25 million in Silicon Valley, but, but, uh, but here, may, maybe not quite so much. But, but, but obviously there's, you know, and, and, and for an investor, they know that the money that they're gonna give a startup 
is going to last a lot longer because they're not having to pay £150,000 to their lead developer and whatever. So um, there are hand, handfuls of good investors uh, here in, in Wales, but, but not, nowhere near enough to, I think, to service the emerging uh, bunch. There's a real clear bunch of uh, really smart startups coming up now. And if I were an investor in London, I'd be really starting to look seriously at the regions. You know, I think the Northeast, Newcastle have done very well. Edinburgh's done very well. Um, but, uh, but yeah, there's, there's some real uh, opportunities here. Neil, if you look at what is, what is the positive, though, um, at the end of the day, it is on the agenda for, for Welsh Government. Um, you know, the investment is there. The Seed Startup Fund, which has been mentioned a couple of times, you know, from Finance Wales is important. The support the Welsh Government gives to innovation inside businesses, from, for example, ESIS, which is, you know, is, is 25, 25, 30 people under, under three years old, um, wouldn't be where it is today without some of that, some of that support that's come from, from Welsh Government. So from, a, from a, what, what is available, I think, is actually looking to see what can be achieved and what, uh, and what support can be brought in. So I think there are many benefits to being in Wales, and you know, with our seven, eight businesses, whatever we've got, you know, I think uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't want them anywhere else. I think uh, they work very well here, and uh, I'm very pleased that they're here. And over those businesses, now there must be 200 people that are in jobs that wouldn't have jobs, um, that didn't have jobs two years ago, uh, three years ago. What, one, uh, one thing that, that, that has struck me quite a bit, though, that is a massive problem I think we face in Wales is the lack of diversity we have in our, in our startup scene. Uh, this panel is a very good example of that. Uh, I can think of one female tech founder who was sort of raised uh, seed funding in, in Cardiff. Um, and it kind of, I think, we, in fact, we were discussing this earlier, something like 40% of the top 100 tech startups in Silicon Valley uh, come from first or second generation immigrant families. You know, some, something like, you look at the Forbes top 100 in the States, it's um, as, of Americans, it's littered with uh, uh, Indian, Indian uh, people who've, uh, or first or second generation Indians who've come over and done fabulous things for the economy and their communities. And uh, I look, we, we struggle a lot, particularly with uh, the fact that there are very, very few female tech founders in the, in the Cardiff uh, sort of uh, sector or community, you know. Ollie from Noddle Pod is one, uh, Zan, uh, honorary uh, Cardiff startup, uh, but there, there really aren't that many, and I think it's I think it's a real huge problem uh, because it's psychologically proven more diverse groups are better at solving mm -hmm. problems, and we don't just want a bunch of white middle class uh, nerds. Warren Fovell, CEO. <laughs> so on that note, we, we've got probably time for a couple more questions. So anyone else in the audience? <laughs> Can I get this person at the back over here? On the right? Oh, sorry. Uh, hi there. Um, yeah, you've mentioned various types of funding. You haven't mentioned asset or mainstream funding at all. Just wondered why no one's uh, used that in conjunction with... Because we with all the run tech businesses and there's no assets in tech businesses when you start... What? No, no software, no IT, no well, desks, no furniture? So, uh, uh, so it's, uh, Cedra and, and f furniture is like... So most, most I think it's a, it's, a, it's a symptom of the operational model. So I move into a hot desk in space and you keep everything lightweight. It's, it's not built on that. I know that's kind of... The history of Welsh business is built on putting in large pieces of machinery and writing those capital off for over three years and amortising them and what, what not. But that's not where we are. Um, if you're I, I, to think, I think, though, with, with due respect, I don't think you're, um, most businesses, especially in this sector, are now aware of the amount of money that actually is sloshing around. There's so much investment. There's so many people who have come into this country now who want to lend the money out there. The, the old traditional asset finance model of, of plant and machinery is, is a little bit of a thing of the past now. There's a, there's a lot of money sloshing around there in, in terms for, for other things and not just uh, an asset you can pick up and take away. I think you'd be surprised. 
So it's from a from a so we're at a seed round, and so from a seed round, you're actually you're raising the money to create the asset. So um, a lot of what we're doing is trying to drive intellectual property into the business, drive those market relationships into the business, and you know de-risk it for the A round. And an A round, you may look to bring in some of that mixture of financing against you know you so you do your two and a half million at a ten million valuation, and then you match it with some other kind of debt lines or whatever that may be against those infrastructure pieces that you want to create whether that's an office space and making it you know connected to the internet stronger or whatever those pieces of intellectual property are you want to leverage overseas but really the the that kind of that kind of investment at the very early stages sometimes it can be arduous to, to, to put in and and ultimately you don't have those assets to put it against unless you're a you know you might be a, a spin out from a larger organization where they're injecting the intellectual property into into that spin out um, so I can only speak for myself and in terms of nudged, we started from a, an absolute standing start. We didn't have a line of code to begin with and we were lean from the ground up. So it took us about 12 months to even you know, start building anything that would even be considerable as intellectual property. And we still held off on those asset-based uh, you know, investments because really we're, we're just trying to learn quicker than everyone else. So all of our money goes into iteration and learning. Um, assets come later on, and they will come before that, that A round. We, we definitely have to consolidate, but I don't know what about the rest of the guys on the stage. Has anyone else got more of an assets? It, it, you're, you're exactly right. It, it depends where the business is. Yeah, so um, one of our businesses has just done a round of asset funding because it's quite a large business, and we're refitting an office, and we're taking on another you know, half a million quids worth of kit into the data center and that sort of stuff. So I suppose... Just again, it's a time and a place. If you're a lean startup that um, that's you know hasn't is asset light at this point, which is absolutely fine, is the way to be. Then uh, you know, but it's it again. I think someone said it's horses for courses. It depends where the business is, where it is in the cycle, and what type of funding it's looking for. I mean, I think the business is here. I think we're talking about at least two to three years. I think before you even think about doing sort of asset funding. But at some point, you know, then then it might be appropriate to do that. So I'm just going to take one more question. I think this guy in the front. Yeah. I think it's going to be the last question, and then we're just going to sort of round up quickly. Hi. Uh, thank you very much. So I just wondered whether the panel could share their experience or knowledge about uh, the process of identifying the investor in the first place? Did you do lots of research or did they come to you? And, and also a, a sense of time in terms of how you described you know, uh, your business model, understanding the value of your business, and then either getting approached or you approaching uh, for some money. How long did that take to, so you got a landed deal? Uh, so it... it <laughs> We've got, a, we've got a, one minute, so if we, there's a lot of moving parts. Quick. Think of it as dating. You, you, you have to like kiss a lot of frogs. I think was mentioned earlier. It's, it's very much about figuring out who you want, and you can go and hunt them, or you can gather them. If you're gathering them, expect it to take a lot of time, and forgive yourself for meeting a lot of the wrong people and being in a lot of the wrong meetings. If you know what you're doing and you know who you want, go and talk to that person. So if you're entering you know, an investment market and you need connections to investors, then guys who used to rent, run hedge funds have lots of money and have lots of connections and you want to go and speak to them. And platforms like, you know, uh, AngelList and things like that are a great, great place to start to start to identify people who are actively investing in, think in those of it areas. Like peeling, uh, sorry. Think of it like peeling back layers. When I first started looking for investors, I'd go for investor meetings and it was like, ah, that doesn't work. And then at the end of each meeting, I say, is there anyone else you think I should be talking to? And they go, oh, well, you, yeah, you, of course you should. And actually, investors on the whole, I've really, it's, I think the, um, what's it called, the, the Alan Sugar Show, The Apprentice and Dragon's Den are the worst representations of entrepreneurship. They're basically competition to see who can be the least worst asshole. basically. It's, they're not competitions about entrepreneurship, they're TV shows. Um, and I've not met an investor, I don't think, I can't really remember an investor I didn't like and who wasn't willing to actually introduce me to other investors and be nice and be, because almost every single one of them would have been exactly where you're sat and they're sympathetic to that. So, if they, if they say, not for me, then say, is there anyone else? And they will know other people. Yeah. So no, I think that's, that's, that, that's very true. And I think, uh, you know, there's never going to be enough investors. But I think, uh, I think there's a need to, you know, there needs to be a bigger outlet to sort of say, where do, we, where do you start? 
but I think you know we've seen some successes here. So I think on that note, I'd like to thank the panel um, for this, Warren, Tom, Neil, Ben, and Simon, and thank you very much.